Well, first of all, congratulations, Bob, on an extraordinary book. Uh, and I'm going to spend my time sort of explaining why that congratulations needs to be underscored and uh, given exclamation points and so forth, because uh, the richness and complexity of this book has compelled me to do something that I never like to do. And that is that uh, I'm completely in a state of chaos as to how to comment on it. <laughs> and so, I mean, I, I've got this sort of mess of notes here. I mean, I hate doing that because there's a huge risk when that happens. Um, but I, I do remember reading one of Robert's early books on this subject, Reaching for Heaven on Earth, The Theological Meaning of Economics, almost 20 years ago. And I remember reviewing it at the time and thinking, I'm not quite sure he's right about a lot of things in this book, but boy, he's on to something really interesting. And so, I mean, uh, I'm not sure I can make this comparison at um, the Independent Institute, but you know, uh, you think about early Marx and late Marx. Well, this is uh, reaching for heaven on earth was early Nelson, and this is late Nelson, the sort of full-blown Nelson in full. Too late. <laughs> well, right. Um, let me see if I can bring some order to my chaos, uh, like God and creation, in the following way. Uh, when I think about the subject of environmentalism as religion, I'm reminded of a time I was in London, you know, 15 years ago or more and flipping around the telly and catching one of those classic British comedy sketches. It's one of their sort of uh, the runners, they call it the comedy business. It's the talk show where the guest was the Lord Jesus Christ who'd returned for the second coming. And you had that BBC host saying, well, tonight our guest is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's back after 2,000 years away. And, you know, and Welcome, Mr. Christ. And, and he says to him, so, you know, a few of the little banter says, I suppose you'll be back to doing your usual miracles, you know, healing the sick and the lame and, you know, turning water into wine and such. <clears throat> and Jesus says, oh, yes, I assume so. Of course, within the limits of sustainable development. <laughs> now, there's a bit of an ambiguity in that sketch. What, what exactly is being made fun of there? Uh, is it religion? which is what British comedy sketches are usually making fun of, or is it environmentalism, or is it both? Or is not there at a deeper level in a way that comedy often catches better than uh, philosophy or social criticism? Is there not catching the, the denigration of religion overall? I think, I think that joke works for both sides of, of Robert's analysis here. Uh, because, you know, uh, Robert's first book sent me back to something that I sort of um, arrested me once 30 years ago now. It was a special issue of the public interest in 1980 where Irving Kristol wrote, and I'll quote him, theology has practically ceased to be a respectable form of intellectual activity. Now the context for this was, this was a special issue of the public interest about the crisis in economic theory. You know, cast your mind back to 1980, everything wasn't working. Uh, the doctrine of economic progress had smashed against the wall. Keynesianism doesn't work. We were stuck with stagflation and all the rest of that. You might say we're in a similar situation today with the whole matter turned inside out. Deflation instead of inflation, right? But our economists are, we don't have a lot of stock in them right now, do we? We sort of lost that confidence. Uh, but the, obviously the unstated premise of both the comedy sketch or Irving Kristol's remark is that, you know, religion is not quite respectable. Why not? Well, that's not um, a... Um, you know, mysterious subject. Uh, one of the things that Roberts explained in several of his works, including this one, is, uh, you know, the rise of economics as the technical um, uh, um, deliverer of the idea of progress arises out of the whole Enlightenment project's faith that material forces uh, would replace natural or divine law, that faith in progress replaces faith in providence, and economists replace the priests. Uh, and I think he was right to say that economics takes on a form of religion, at least insofar as reason requires, a sort of the, you know, reason with a capital R, requires perhaps as much of a leap of faith uh, as uh, religion does. I mean, this is something that postmodernists are onto. I mean, I, I sort of dislike postmodernism, but I think it's not an accident that the postmodern skepticism about the idea of progress really began to gain traction at exactly the moment economics began to run into trouble in the late 1960s. I think that's roughly right. Uh, and uh, Robert uh, repeats a lot of great quotes from, among others, Keynes. So, you know, Keynes talking about how economic controversies, quote, resemble medieval disputations at their worst. So, you know, I think uh, Robert has done something that almost nobody ever does. You know, usually when you say to an environmentalist, well, you know, environmentalism is a religion, 
they take it as an insult. And usually, by the way, a lot of people who say that mean it as an insult or denigration, right? A lot of critics do. And what Robert's done is taken them seriously, or taken the phenomenon seriously. A lot of environmentalists will say, no, I'm, I'm science-based. I'm interested in science. And they'll re resist what you're saying about that it's a religious creed. Although a few, of course, uh, will readily admit it. And there have been a lot of, uh, uh, you know, religious, um, a lot of environmentalists who have embraced religion and are religious analogies. And so I, I guess you might say, by the way, that environmentalism, like Christianity, has a lot of diversity in it. How many kinds of Lutherans do we have? I've lost count. There are a lot of different kinds of environmentalists. And I, I think, by the way, it's sometimes a mistake to say the environmental movement or all environmentalists think X, when in fact there really is a range. There are some commonalities to all of them, just as the commonality of Christianity is the divinity of Christ and, and you know, the, the basics of the creed, but then along the way you have all kinds of differences in styles of worship and emphasis in styles of baptism and so forth. Well, environmentalists are like that too, and I think we make a mistake, both uh, you know, critics of environmentalism, which I am a lot of the time, and friends and people in between, in not paying attention to the distinctions that are to be made out there. And one of them is between environmentalists who would make a wholesale rejection of a religious character to environmentalism because they share the premise, uh, sort of the enlightenment premise that religion is not quite respectable. Uh, and then those environmentalists who are actually open to it, the ones who do talk, as Robert said, about places like Anwar as being a sacred space in the fullness of that meaning. Well, there's a couple of ways to slice this up, it seems to me, in addition to the way uh, that Robert has done it. Um, you know, another way I sometimes uh, have analyzed environmentalism, and especially I thought this about Al Gore's famous first book, Earth and the Balance, is that it reminds me a lot on a purely secular level um, of Martin Heidegger's uh, famous argument that technology has separated mankind from nature. And it's alienated us from nature. This is sort of a premise of existentialism. Um, and you know, if you go back and read, you know, I'm not sure it's any better in the original German, but which I don't read, but in translation it's very difficult. But if you read Heidegger's essay on technology, he talks about how, written in the early 50s, you know, we rip coal out of the ground and burn it, and throw pollution up into the air. Uh, and he's suggesting that this is. He doesn't quite use this word, but it's unnatural in a certain way. And you can see a lot of environmental themes there that make their reappearance really quite dramatically, I think, in Gore's book and in other, uh, and, that, and of course, he's an atheist. And he's skeptical of reason, too. Uh, but very late in his life, if you know the story of Heidegger, uh, in you know, a year or two before he died, he gave an interview where he said, uh, we've reached such a desperate position of man being separated from nature that only a god can save us. So he, even he was open to a religious answer to this problem, if you can understand him at all, which is problematic. But I think this is interesting stuff. Um, now, <laughs> Bob raised uh, the point that I often talk about, about environmentalist hostility to economics. Um, you know, you mentioned David Brower, who was often called, I think, in that famous biography of him by John McPhee, the arch druid of environmentalism, you know, a pagan term, right? Well, I don't know if you remember this, Bob, but I've got the slide I should share with you. He took out a full-page ad in the New York Times in 1993. And what a full-page ad, so that was like $50,000 ad in 1993. The headline of the ad was, Economics is a form of brain damage. <laughs> QED, right? As you're, and you know, this thing was going on to say, uh, you know, please, President Clinton, don't listen to these maniacs who want you to apply cost-benefit tests to regulation. Uh, okay. Uh, the year before that at the Rio Earth Summit, uh, Hazel Henderson, a fairly famous activist of her time, said, come the eco-revolution, we're going to round up economists and send them to re-education camps. <laughs> so I, I want to say that I actually think that the real conflict, uh, I, I think, by the way, environmentalists have sort of gotten over that to some extent. My observation is very few mainstream environmentalists, or whatever term you want to use, would say that kind of thing today. They more openly embrace, especially in this climate issue, uh, the importance of economics and thinking through at least policy choices, although I often find their grasp of economics to be at about the kindergarten level, but that's another story for another day. I think at the end of the day, there's a much deeper conflict um, between conventional environmentalism or religious environmentalism and Christianity. A and Bob hinted at a couple of the problems here, and I just want to deepen them a little bit, and then I'll stop. Um, 
Bob pointed at some of the similarities. Uh, you can make out similarities between uh, uh, you know, uh, the creation story, man being thrown out of the Garden of Eden for its sin, which can find its rough parallel today, I suppose, the Industrial Revolution, or any number of other ways you can think about it. Um, uh, but you know, just as it's possible to make out Marxism as a Christian heresy, it seems to me that environmental religion, in a, the main features that Bob has pointed out, is also a Christian heresy. Uh, for one thing, Bob mentioned this, but it just re-emphasized this point. There is a completely different view from Christianity uh, in the place of humankind in the hierarchy of nature. And let me restate that and say environmental religion essentially denies that there is a hierarchy of nature. There is really nothing distinctive about the human species over the other animals or over, or, so they would reject the idea that's explicit in Genesis of man's dominion over nature and responsibility of stewardship over nature. Um, it may not be formally egalitarian, but here and there uh, people will point to um, environmentalists who will say things like, and there's, these quotes are famous, right? The person who says something like, you know, if it's a contest between a bear and a human being, I'm not sure who I'd root for. Or the, the government biologist who wrote that article in the Los Angeles Times in 1989, I think, reviewing Bill McKibben's book, The End of Nature, where he said, uh, you know, the mankind is a plague on the planet comment, and, you know, until we change our human, our fundamental nature as a species, we can only hope for the right virus to come along, you know, to thin us out. That comes to side in the worst expressions of environmental religion, this hostility to humanity, or if not hostility, at least um, um, a rejection of the idea that human beings have an exalted place below the angels but above the animals and beasts of the field that is explicit in Christian theology. That makes the two doctrines or the two religious approaches to thinking about our planet and creation fundamentally irreconcilable, I would suggest. It seems to me that's a, a harder conflict than the one between economics and environmentalism. Because as I say, I see some progress of environmentalists, baby steps at least, in understanding economics as a tool they need to use. Because what is economic study? Resources, as you were saying. Um, I'll just add this observation. Oh, I've gone too long anyway. Um, you mentioned resources for the future, and this is slightly off the topic, but you know, resources for the future was founded by one of the original doomsayers of environmentalism, Fairfield Osborne in the late 1940s. He wrote a book called Our Plundered Planet, which was one of the first in that whole genre of we're all doomed. And so what's kind of interesting is resources for the future ended up as a bunch of economists, very much in the center of the political spectrum, <laughs> resented by the doomsayers. I mean, you know, if you talk to a lot of environmentalists, they don't like resources of the future very much because they're those grubby economists who tell us that things that cost more than the benefits they deliver are not worth doing, and they hate hearing that because that crosses your theological imperative. Thanks very much. <laughs>